document from a 2023 perspective now. Yeah. This has just gone through a bit of a change. So you'll notice some similarity, but it's a lot quicker. And it's a lot easier for people like yourself to talk to other people about the right. reason why we need to do measurement. Yeah. Now, as we know, there is no lack of measurement at all. Mm. It's everywhere we go these days, we can measure anything that moves. I like the little joke associated with this. The only one that people are paying attention to is that KPI trending to zero. It's in our measurement system. We need something simple. We need something straight, or what it needs to be able to be understood by everybody. Why do we need a measurement system from the outside in? Reminding you about the way people can game systems like MPS and CSAT. Yeah. yeah. But I've been either gaming it in a very selective way to demonstrate our results are improving. <laughs> we get better. And ironically, as we recall with this, Tesla's number of customer complaints was going up almost exponentially at the same time that they were supposedly best in the automotive industry in t from 2016 to 2018. Uh -oh. So we need a, a more objective, forward-looking measurement system. And when I say forward-looking, the measurement systems that we've inherited, particularly in the CX world, yeah. tend to be retrospective and subjective. That's what this is about. It's about building that bridge. Okay. And though we covered off the measurement systems in the ACX Masters, the difference this time is that we're looking at measurement from the landscape perspective. So mm -hmm. you won't be just doing one experience. You may have several experiences you want to put on the dashboard. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're talking about aggregate and that sort of thing. And cool. I'm just about to push out, you'll see this on the wire soon, that James Dolkin's videos, which talks about the 10 ways to improve your MPS scores. Yeah, and I look forward to it. As I said yesterday, there are ways that unfortunately we've seen across our network of people using each one of those techniques. And as bizarre as James makes them sound, and it's a funny video, it nevertheless shows the amount of corruption that Reichschild was talking about here. It's because some people don't do it because they're devious. Some people mm -hmm. do it just to demonstrate they're doing a better job. Yeah, uh, they do. They're not malevolent necessarily. Yeah. But yeah. if we're all blind to that manipulation, it's about how do we get MPS to be more scientific? So something in South Africa will remain nameless, said, yeah, but he's done NPS 3.0, and now he's looking at earned value and things like that. And they go, why didn't they start out like that? That would have been a lot easier than convincing the world, convincing typically boards of executives that there is a good measure. And in the vacuum of there being nothing else other than CSAT, people adopt it. And they say, no, we use customer effort score. And you go, okay, customer effort score is one mechanism that you can, and yeah. it, does, it does reflect more objectivity than the subjective. If you ask me on a Monday, what score are you going to give me from zero to 10? Oh, it's a Monday. Three. Ask me yeah. on a Friday. I'll give you seven. Yeah, seven is Friday. We can go to the weekend. <laughs> so let's get away from that subjectivity and not keep arguing the toss about NPS is good or not. Let's get a more objective set of measures. Stop putting lipstick on the pig as we, we did yeah. it before. There we have. Just making something, discussing a brand perception is really important, but if you're not doing the right thing, it's, it is lipstick on a pig. So here we are, here's the dashboard. It'll look similar to the one that you've seen before, but tidied up. And we're going to go through it very quickly by example as we do it. So once more, if you get a question, let me know. And likewise, the guys watching the recording, ping me back if it still doesn't make sense. Sure. All the dashboard is focused on the causes of work, the moment of truth. So it's a measure of a, at a moment of truth. It can be real time. Yes. There's a couple of organizations are already piloting real time in South Africa at the moment, and they have literally in the service centers, they have the electronic dashboard up there and yeah. they can see it changing and it does its usual thing. If something's going off kilter, it goes red. Yeah. They're usually amber or green, but you can act in the moment. I think that's the important thing to know is yeah. if you know, that, and that, is it? Yeah, it's James who said that about the, I quote him a lot because he's a, having been a showman when he was a guitarist in the band, yeah. Yeah. he's a really good communicator. He so comes he, across very well. He does. Yeah. yeah. And it, he scripts everything. You wouldn't guess it's all scripted because he's a to ad lib. And I saw him on yeah. stage in Vegas. There was like 2,000 people there. Mm. And it was the best best keynote I've ever seen, other than perhaps somebody doing a TED talk or whatever. Yeah. But nevertheless, he did it with a guitar. But he, yeah. it's all scripted, but you would never guess it. Amazing. So why did I mention that there? Because, oh, he talks about if you have to go and ask the customers for feedback, you don't know how you're doing. And exactly. That's the reality. Yeah. Yeah, Steve, just offline. Can I chat you offline? Do these sites? Oh, maybe we can, I can have a yeah, chat. Yeah, we'll do that. Have a look. 
We'll do it off that. Okay. Yeah, do it later on this week and then we can connect you with them and you can go and actually have a talk with the people who are actually building these things out. Sometimes what we have to do as well with champions is get them to sign a non-disclosure with that organisation. Yeah. But it, I make sure I'll do the logistics behind that and then if you have to sign a non-disclosure, it's just like a one-pager. So you're not going to work or where divulge all this. You can copy and emulate it, but don't go and you know, do videos. Yeah, and hopefully it's non-competitive anyway. So yeah, let's see. Cool. Yeah, and in the situation you're in, I can think of lots of organizations we can take you to that are in the same business, but they're not in the same industry. Yes. Gotcha. Um, so doing that comparison will be good. Exactly. Again, with everybody on the call, we'll take that one offline. I agree. Um, perhaps, you know, when the exercises come in, yeah, uh, and we have a chat. We'll do it. This. Good idea. So here we have the completed one. This was, you'll recall, we've used this one before. This was the onboarding process to Canadian Business School. So the customer receives an information pack, completes an application form, confirms the final acceptance, arrives on the first day, experiences induction, checking for recreation. So do you want to be in the basketball team or something and attend the first day of class? So let's go through each one. So every moment of truth must have a unique ID, not just for this experience. So for instance, the next experience we would look at, which was the alumni, we did a, a, some work with these guys through our Canadian partners in Quebec around the alumni. So that first moment of truth in the alumni experience was moment of truth number eight. So it does have a u unique ID. Okay. Uh, it's also an ind indicative that when you're looking at moment of truth number 364, the 364 moments of truth that you're having the customer's experience. <laughs> yeah. Give the description to every moment's truth. And as I say, when people are doing the moments of truth, I always put the word customer in front. So in the dashboard context, it's customer receives information pack, customer yeah. completes application form and so on like that. Okay. Uh, and always have the sub action words there. The reason for that again is to differentiate the moments of truth from the descriptions of handovers. Because in handovers, it's not a customer interaction. It's a, an interaction that's taking place within our organization or our partners that the customer is not necessarily aware of. Yeah, and doesn't care about, but yeah. ultimately impacts his SEO, yeah. <laughs> so the customer parlance is important because if you're working, say, with an enabling customer, so you're doing some internal work on behalf of another department to improve something that they're doing, they're your customer, but all the other relationships that your internal department and that internal department are having with other people would be handovers, they would be interactions. Gotcha. So it's, it's applicable across, it's completely scalable and applicable across the funders, the watchers, and the enablers. So then we have a type of moment of truth. We call the six different types. What that can allow you to do, not with one experience, but from a champion's perspective, where you're looking at several experiences and you're bringing them to the dashboard, mm -hmm. is what are the predominant types of moments of truth that we've got? Yeah. yeah. So you, in a very automated environment, you have lots of system-to-system -system ones. And I've seen situations where people have, we have too many system to system moments of truth. Can we humanize some of them? So that that happens use. sometimes. Yeah. I yeah. can you imagine? Scrapping yeah. the automated voice response system and having people make that phone again. No. Yeah. Or, 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 or the WhatsApp robot, which never answers your your question properly. But yeah, the, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the, eventually you, the, dealing with those, some of the primitive chatbots, yeah. well, not the chat GBT chatbots, no. but the, the early chatbots. And then eventually, after 10 minutes of interaction, they then say, I need to transfer you to a human being. That's exactly. That's why I'm bald. I've pulled my hair out already. <laughs> <laughs> so identifying the type is less useful with just one experience. But if you've got lots of experience, you might want to produce some bar charts which show the occurrence of person to person to system and so on. Cool. Uh, and then ident having identified that, is going to say, okay, there's a lot of people for instance, a lot of people-to-people -people interactions here, which might be a good or a not-so-good thing. Are there some of those that we could easily automate and take the pain away from the customer? A uh, good example is that one of, we all want it to be automated, is what's our bank balance? Yes. However, if it's a, mul a multi-query, mm. then you still have to navigate the damn AVR again yeah. to get to talk to somebody. The reason why you're querying your bank balance is, do I have enough in my account to pay for this, or should I get a loan? Or should I get a short-term overdraft agreed? That sort of a thing. Yeah. yeah um, so the, usually the questions aren't linear. And unfortunately, the way those things are programmed traditionally is yeah. to just be very good at transactional responses. Yeah. We've seen the one example I quote in the States is with Cabela's. They were a great big outfitting store. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they offshored the call centers to Singapore. Yeah. 
loads of complaints from people saying they don't understand us. Right? <laughs> so they said, it must be a language difficulty and or something like that. So they were training up all these Singaporean people in the, the yeah. National Football League so they could talk about last night's scores. Uh -huh. Something was interesting. But of course, they're still doing it with, in a foreign language. So all these complaints kept coming in. So eventually, after four years of it being outsourced, they brought it on shore again. We put it in a place called Newark, near New York. Yes, I know. It but Newark, and Newark is, to anybody, even in the States, they are, it's a strange accent. It's a very nasal accent. So still the complaints were coming in that customers didn't understand us. So what they decided to do then over a period of two years was put a call center in each state. So for instance, if you're in Texas, you'd talk to somebody who had a Texas accent. Yes. So great, we're solving that problem. Still the complaints were coming in. And around right about this point, we got involved through our partners over there through, was it the, the oh, process triage they're called. I always think it's a fantastic name for creating that sort of, you're going to triage your processes. But anyhow, yeah. we got involved with those partners when we went in. And we were looking at the nature of the complaints and rather than looking at the number of complaints, which was an indicator that all complaints are going up and down, uh, what was the distribution of complaints and why were they weren't? Typically it was they don't understand us. Mm -hmm. And what the Cabela's people had done was assume understanding was related to language, but it wasn't. What was happening when we listened in on the calls retrospectively to somebody who's complained, yeah. the guy would say phone up and he would say, I'm going duck hunting on the Red River in a couple of weeks, but I need new tires for my Jeep. And I need some new buckshot. And have you got those new rifles in with this? The queries customers were asking for now because they're professional consumers now. Okay. They knew what they needed, not just what they wanted. They knew what they needed. And yet the people who were being trained in the call centers were still following scripts and they could answer a linear question. Where do I go and buy new tires from? And they go, you need to go to your stories in... Dallas, and you need to go to the aisle 32. Right. About the bookshop for my rifle, I need to transfer you to another colleague. Or... Uh, okay. It was that sort of a thing. So for the lack of understanding, and not understanding me, was to do with queries have become much richer. Mm. And the automation they were using, I'm not saying automation couldn't help, but the automation they were using was actually getting in the way of customers being able to buy products and get something. I always said, don't just look at the number. And so we need to get complaints down that the, like you were saying, in terms of NPS scores and feedback and using mechanisms like that is look under the covers about what's actually going on. Exactly. And if you've got indicative scores, dig deeper. Don't just take the service of it. No, I've got you. So then each mom to true should be assigned an owner and ultimately the owner should be individuals. Correct. So we'll have certain types of moments of truth that are owned by certain types of individuals. So it, it would be somebody, say for instance, moment of truth number four arrive on the first day, which is owned by the registrar department. It's going to be somebody with a registrar skill set who owns that moment of truth. And originally they might have sat in the registrar department, but now they're in the inner circle with another bunch of people in and around this, the different categories of customers these guys had. They had these were newbie, customers, newbie students where we were applying this. But they're also similar experience to people who could along to do their masters and the PhDs and things like that. But they already know their way through the system. Yeah. So in that instance, the ownership of the moment of truth might be different. So for instance, they arrive on the first day. If you're a master's student, your arrival isn't built around your need to work, know how to navigate the buildings and get to that place where your registration desk is. You already know all. So the person that you're dealing with who actually owns the moment of truth there is probably somebody you already know from that campus. It's probably somebody you've already had uh, meetings with and things like that. So it does that the majority of the organization within the experience will determine oftentimes the ownership of each moment of truth. Yeah. Then we talk about abacus. Where is this moment of truth in terms of the customer life cycle? A, awareness, B, buy-in, A, C is acquisition. C is customization, S is share, and U is use again. Yes. Gotcha. And so we could see that distribution. In one experience, yeah, that's interesting, but rather like the type, if we've got lots of experiences, we'll want to aggregate those and look at the shape of that. Mm -hmm. The example I often quote in that context is with Dyson, who before they went, became outside in. When we looked at the Abacus model for the current state, they were very good in use of the product. So once you bought the product, so they were very helpful in the usability of it and Storm, but they didn't have very much in terms of awareness of buying because they assumed word of mouth was sufficient. And though they did traditional marketing, being able to 
let people, and this is where brand affinity would come in, is if you've been to the bathroom and you're coming out and the hand dryer is a Danfoss, sorry, is a Dyson machine. You go, oh, do you really nice to do that? And during the pandemic, they were doing ventilators and they started building ventilators because some of the technology associated with that is very similar to the the type of vacuum technology that they use. Okay. okay. So with that sort of thing in the future state then, so rather like the little diagram down below when you're talking, did I do an example of this? Yeah, so in the diagram you're looking at there. Oh, there we go. Yeah. That is that the new experience as it was mapped out. And you can see some sometimes like Mob's Truth 2 straddles awareness and buy-in. Sure. But you can see the distribution then across the that cycle. Now, if you're doing this across many experiences, yeah. organizations in the current state will have a preponderance. So in this instance, they spent a lot of time making sure in the current state, a lot of time making sure that this student was right for the school. So the customization of the product was happening all the time. Yeah. And you go, why do you do that? So because we got good at it. And you go, that's not a reason to keep on doing it, is it? Because if you can identify there's four different needs, you wouldn't yeah. need to customize it the way that you're doing it at an individual level and have a one-on-one -on -one with each person. What you can do is give those people could have a pack, which is the FAQs. Those people could have a chat mod they can go to. These people could have a one-to-one -one because they have a different... But breaking it out like that means the customization is part of experience induction in the future state, the one that they actually deployed. So experience in the induction and then slice it depending on the type of induction experience you wanted to create. The other perspective on this as well is we talk on macro moments of truth, operationalized CX, which is these moments of truth and micro moments of truth. And there is a case for actually saying, say I was in IT. And I'm hoping you build this capability, the digital capability around it. I might look at Mom's Drift number five and I said, there's not enough granularity there for me to understand what type of system we need to build for that. Okay. In which case, from an IT perspective, we then identify the micro moments of truth. Yeah. Okay. Within, that allows us then to design the system. But from a customer's perspective, it is just that one moment of truth. It's like, oh, I'm experiencing in done. This is going to last about 20 minutes. They give you a little talk on the campus, the rules of the campus, where you can go, where you can't go, what you can do and not so on like that. Health and safety, that type of thing. Well, all those things are micro moments of truth that during that induction experience, yeah, you might need to see them. And so this is where you would take this. And as you're building your, your CPL yeah. and you look to your digital capability, you probably have two rows for moments of truth. You'd have the operational moments of truth. Yeah. And then we have the micro moments of truth. I've got two different user stories or subsets of... Yes, that's right, yeah. And, and that's the language I would use with people who are familiar with it. I mean, what are the user stories here for these different categories of customer that you've got? Yeah, got you. So that's the um, abacus really thing. Now, I talked about relationship earlier on, and we were talking about, in the context of a moment of truth, so receive information pack. That's the first time we've used this moment of truth in any experiences. So it only has a relationship of one-to-one, -one, one to itself. But say as with money laundering, we have every category of customer, regardless of the product they're going to buy from us, has to go through the money laundering moments of truth. In which case, that moment of truth, number one, might have eight instances, nine instances, as many categories of customer have we got okay. in that moment of truth column. Okay. We use this one in the masters and it teaches people about the experience. But again, the usefulness of it is when you've got lots of experiences and you're putting them on the dashboard and you're looking at the moments of truth, which have the greatest reusability. And we used to have a metric called reusability. Mass. So you, you don't have to keep reinventing moments of truth if you bring in a new product to market or go for a different category of customer. They are, they are reusable. And one of the indicators there is how many instances of this moment of truth are there across our categories of customer. Yeah, I like it. Object oriented customer design. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <I'm not> <laughs> yeah it's really, I'm just going to trademark that now. <laughs> Get to <laughs> and, and no, 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 I'm confusing languages there. I think it, it's good when I think about structured systems analysis yeah. and design um, and entity life mapping and things like that. Yeah. There's a lot of analogies that people don't have unless you've had exposure to those sort of things. Yeah. And nested moments of truth, I often refer to that. Yes. Uh, when some sort of people say, what do you mean by nested moment of truth? So I'll get into discussing like Google do, Google do, like <laughs> a macro 
operational and micro moments of truth. So I used to say instead of operational moments, I used to say in process. But a lot of the CX people think, oh, that's a process thing. That's nothing to do with us. And you go, no, it's in the process. <laughs> yeah, but we don't do process. We do CX. And by the time you're having those sort of discussions, you think, you know, the use of language sometimes. So I say operationalizing customer experience, right, rather than in process. Customer experience. Likewise, each moment's truth has a relationship in terms of handovers. And so let's have a look at that on the diagram. So this one was Terry in Texas. And we can see, understand and query that task, the moment of truth, which needs to create that task is the customer relates an issue. And there's two handovers in that relationship and one business rule, the green one that sits on the on update customer database. Right. Cool. So what we're doing there again is just looking at the relationship side of it. How many moments of truth have relationships with how many handovers and business rules? And immediately like number four, the arrive on first day. The seven handovers in association with that. Where are all these handovers? What are we doing? Because the last all the yeah. And it, that's the case of though the handover is an effect created by a moment of truth, we still have this moment of truth, but we've got wood on the surface appear to be too many handovers. So let's go and have a look at that. So you'd be sitting down with the registrar saying, "Why do you have seven? What are the seven? Walk me through this." And then when you see him, you can say, "All oh, right, okay, yeah, I get that. That's because of compliance. That's because of a regulation. That's because of this." Couldn't we consolidate some of those? Yeah. And you and what I've seen done there with people who have practiced at doing it is they'll run an innovation workshop around the internal interactions. Yes. So which are the ones we can make go away? And in turn, that sometimes allows you to uh, change the moment of truth in a way that it's much more faster and more streamlined and so on. Exactly. That's where my mind goes to. And run them in parallel and show that, you know, so if we look at the bottom line though, we've got seven moments of truth in this experience with 26 handovers. From a, an engineering point of view, remembering that each moment of truth will have on average three or four handovers. That's about right then, isn't it? That's getting up towards four handovers per moment of truth. So it might well be that those moments of truth, which have got seven handovers, they're, they're okay. It's all right to be like that, but it would draw your attention to it. Gotcha. The fact that it's sort of standing out like that. And there seemed to be, there was when we did this second recall it I've got the scars to prove it a lot of business rules for this relatively simple experience when we got into it there was an embargo on changing any business rules during that time so this actual future state inherited some old fashioned business rules that we knew we could eradicate the compliance and audit people were going through a big audit at the time it was like a three month you can't change any business rules we can't come to any meetings we're not going to do any of so we couldn't even get them in the room to actually talk about why is this rule is this an interpretation of the regulation or is this actually literally what the regulation says we should do yeah and in in this sort of experience as well student onboarding all colleges business schools universities are doing it all the time it's not a life and death situation. Whereas when you're looking at rules, say, in a pharmaceutical concept, sure. yeah. it is life and death. Exactly. <laughs> you do the wrong thing. So it's got different different, different ways of skinning that rabbit. So there's examples in there. The next one is, have we built the performance landscape yet? And it's yes and no. So I do ones and zeros for this. Yeah. And if it's a zero, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It means we haven't got around to doing it yet. But that becomes, again, a call to action. So guys, when are you when are you building your CPL then? Because when you build your CPL, you might be able to eradicate some of those rules and handovers yes. by looking at the connections and the relationships. Yeah. The next one, the proactive reactive index. This is about the distribution of handovers in association with moments of truth. So let me show you the diagram which talks about it. So if we have look at the mess like that, twenty three moments of truth, fifty one handovers, and twelve business rules. <laughs> We knew when they actually put that one on the wall, they'd understated the number of handovers because it must be three or four. So we were thinking it's going to be up in the 70s or 60s and 70s, not just 51. However, once you realize it's like that bent wheel on your bike, you need a new wheel. No amount of examining the wheel is going to make it better. Yeah. So in, in some instances, the, the pragmatist kicks in and you say, okay, that's good enough. We can work with that because we're going to work at the moment's truth level. But And we know there's more than a one-to-one -one relationship here. What? So here we go as a by pictorial example. So this is a current state. And as you recall, the formula is the number of handovers preceding yeah. the only moment of truth over the total number of handovers in that relationship. 
So if you're looking at Moment's Truth 1, it has three handovers in total. One precedes the Moment of Truth to turn it into an index number we times it by 100. So for that one Moment of Truth, it has a PRI, a Proactive Reactive Index, of 33. The optimum will be 100. So we can see that's not great. Yeah. Looking across the experience, we can see that there's five handovers precede their owning moments of truth, divided by 17 handovers in total, which gives us a PRI of 29.4. Now, assuming you took something like this and you innovated it and took it to a new place, yeah, um, as these guys did, they got there from 23, 24 moments of truth down to four. Okay. So in doing that, here's an example. So you've innovated it and you've changed yeah. this. The story I normally tell around this, because we'll all be, we've all made insurance claims, yeah. is in the claims department, typically they'd be sitting there waiting for the phone to ring. And that, that then, that moment of truth then initiates a series of handovers. Yes. It's going to take you through security, checking policy, all that sort of stuff. And however, if you could phone the customers beforehand, I think I mentioned this yesterday, Phone the customer before and say, there's a storm coming in tomorrow, so I don't know if you had a chance to see the weather channel. You might want to bring the kids' toys in out the back garden, put them in the garage, check yeah. if you've got any loose panels on your fence, uh, put the car in the garage because it's forecasting hailstorms as well, and you don't want to get damaged with that. Yeah. Um, we felt if we could do that, we would actually reduce the number of claims that we'd have to process. And here's where we ran into the metrics. The guys, in, as I said yesterday, were getting bonused on the number of claims that they processed and quickly. And... Um, this one thing that they did in this insurance company was reduce the number of claims, which is the most expensive thing they do, is of process and pay out claims. Reduce them by 30% year on year. There we go. Magic. Just by being proactive, doing things up front. So one of the proactive things they did was go get the customer database. Let's start phoning customers. So the first moment of true future state was call the customer, mm. warn them, tell them. Yeah. Of course, the customer point, you and I would say, well, that, gee, I'm pleased they did that because I, I haven't been paying attention to the weather. And if they hadn't have phoned me, I wouldn't know the storm was coming in. And yeah, we could have had some damage. Yeah. I've been meaning to fix that fence post for ages, but I'm going out and get it done there. You know? <laughs> and then across this future state, we can see that the PRI's changed from 29.4 to 80, and the optimum's 100. So we're moving in that right direction now. We can see that we're making good progress. So that's the PRI. And immediately I'm drawn to that lowest PRI score. Again, number two, completely application form. Oh, that's a very, that is very reactive, 33. Whereas looking at five, six, and seven, oh yeah, they're more proactive than not, they're 100, and that's the optimum score. So in this context, PRI higher is better. Yeah. Next, we talk about the risk management. By way of a reminder again, I hope compared with when the last time you did dashboarding, this is a lot more simpler and a lot more straightforward. Yeah, I like it, Steve. Yeah. yeah. And it's easy to explain as well, rather than having a list of 36 measures that we could do. Yeah, we could. We can do 36 measures, but there's probably only two, two or three from the get-go you're going to want to do. And PRI and risk impact are two I always do, because the risk impact one, the easiest way to sort of think about that is, if we fail at this moment of truth, what would the impact be? Yeah. So what would the impact be in the first instance on the customer? Would they be a little bit upset, quite upset, or very upset? So the impact is that we go low, medium, or high. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And, and with that in mind, we can then start to think about some of these moments, of all moments of truth are not created equally. Some are just going to be more impactful than others when we mess up. Yeah. In the same sort of way, if we think about it with a company perspective, uh, we could say, okay, if we messed up at this moment's truth, right, the worst that could happen is we're going to increase our costs. Very serious if we lose some revenue. Compromised service levels, yeah, that's as serious, but not as serious as the first two. And there's a gradation going down. At the time we were doing this, there was a big scandal going on. So one of the things that actually changed in the following year was compliance yeah. regulatory went up to the second and third bullet points. Okay. On that basis, we can now map our moments of truth back onto this risk impact matrix, and we can see the distribution of moments of truth. Now, we want to turn it into a number, so what we do is we assign a, a quantity to each one of those areas on the matrix. And so if your moment of truth is in that high, we mess up as I impact on the customer and I impact on us as an organization, that moment of truth score is 100. You know, it's the ones which are low score are 10. So you can see the yeah. scale on there. And then we can also look at this from the point of view of saying across all the moments of truth, what's the risk impact score across this experience of 12 moments of truth? 
and we can say it's 57 something rather. We know the optimum is nearer to 10. What do questions asked to us then? So what are we doing in the terms of those three in the high to mitigate the chance of failure? What are we doing to get them more towards low, low? So what's the action plans we got in place? What continuous improvement mechanism? So even for future state, as you can see, we can then write the scores down in the boxes where uh, law is better now. So once again, my eyes are drawn to moment of truth number two. Yeah. The first red flag that went up, of course, was that the number of business rules in association with it, but it's PRI of 33 and it's risk impact score of 100. So clearly we were running a risk more so than with the other moments of truth. And if you think about it logically, completing an application form, this is your revenue for next year for the college. Yeah. If they don't complete the application form, they're not even going to put an application in. We're not going to get them over the line. So it is right. Intuitively, we would know that's critical, that people complete application forms. Yeah. And for every 100 application forms we send out, how many do we get returned? Yeah. Only 30. 70 go to our competitors. So, ah, you're saying 30, but how many, how many students started to complete the application form, but the process is so onerous, you've got so many business rules, it's very reactive. And also, when we mess up at this point, it has a severe impact on our bottom line. Yeah. So off we, off we trot to the registrar. We, and the only way the registrar can actually improve that moment of truth, and this is what they had to do, was get together with the other owners and see what they could do to actually smooth some of those things out. How do we make it more proactive? How do we reduce the risk of failure? And what they'd actually done is they'd taken, in the current state, in the previous incarnation of this experience, They'd automated the application form, but they hadn't used that as an opportunity to actually rationalize the application form. For instance, there were three three places in the application form where you had to enter your name and address three times. So already, I mean, on a paper form, you have to do that if you're applying for passports sometimes. But all they do is OCR that into a system now. Yes. So they have this bizarre thing in the UK, I don't know if you know about this, but if you want an urgent passport, which is usually what happens because I fly about a lot, yeah, I never want a passport that's going to take two or three weeks to come back because I've always got a flight the following week. Gotcha. However, to get an urgent passport application through the system, you have to go to the post office to collect a form. I'm thinking, what? In this day and age, you have to go to the post office and collect a form. So I, I get a form. There's no distinguishing mark on that or there's no unique number on that form that you've collected. It's just a generic rapid access passport form. Okay. You can't post that then. You have to physically go to a passport office to be yeah, processed. Of course. Yeah. person responsible for doing that would be the owner of the moment of truth. It's an association with people who are upskilled in facilitation and CX and so on. Okay, so just do a time check. Yeah, we've got time to do this one. So the CX6 now. When you yeah. did the Masters, I would have talked about the four E's. Yes. In our, We have our annual sort of get-together of the affiliates and the coaches and stuff and across all the partners and stuff and we try to come together what's our learning been in the last 12 months a part of that learning was we only introduced four e's about four years ago into the syllabus at the master's level right we determined it's a bridge too far but we're not just determined it's a bridge too far for the champions for the masters it is for the champions as well okay. so at the back of this deck is the four e deck that you may have seen with the masters and it's there, once you've mastered CX6, which as James will explain in his video in a moment, is still somewhat subjective. You can then become really, truly objective. And the, the case studies and examples, you may recall, I use for that is Disney get 100% of feedback 100% of the time as it happens. And because in the theme parks, they're listening to every single conversation. Yeah. Accordingly, they can do what they refer to as action in the moment. And developing action in the moment capability means that if something's going wrong, act on it now. Don't wait. Yeah. Don't send a survey form out, and then two weeks later you find out somebody's complaining about something. Action is the moment capable. And that's the four E's, living, eating, breathing, manifesting itself. We, You realize as you move through this, some organizations are very quick to it because they're very familiar with scoring systems. They're very new, particularly because I've spent a lot of my corporate career in the financial sector. Yeah. And I had, you, had, you have to be new for to work in the financial sector, look okay, at what job it is you're doing. It's all about numbers. Okay. Whereas in some, late, say, fast-moving retail fashion, they're too busy to count sometimes. Yeah. And it's a different right. world. So measurement systems tend to fit into different types of organizations. And the ones that are more newer and more easy get this better. And they realize the subjectivity associated with MPS and CSAT means mm. they're betting the farm mm. on some... Might, might be a malicious feedback from customers or whatever it is. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's just too way, way too subjective. And then Fred Reichel missed that. And, and I don't think he missed it. I think they thought there needs to be a product out here. Everybody's using customer satisfaction. Wouldn't it be great if there was just one score that ruled them all? Yeah, there we go. And that is where they were coming from. That was the way they marketed it anyway. Yeah. You know. And in, in lieu of anything else more scientific at the time, yes, you would use it, but with all the failures associated with it, he then saw that he needed NPS three and yeah. earned value is a good metric, but it's only one metric. Yeah, there are many more. Yeah, absolutely. So you have to create an aggregate six, six allows us to do that and get more coordinated around it. Cool. There's a video of James talking through the CX6, so pause it a minute. And this is one of those videos that I talk about, which is like five or 10 minutes long. Mm -hmm. And we put them in a sequence so that you can access them offline. So that's what I'm going to suggest you do with this, Luke, is have a look at it again. You'll probably see us play it in the masters, but it'll be more meaningful now because it's going to be more useful. If we go back to the dashboard. It's going to be more useful if you've got lots of experiences and you're looking at these vectors, which are to do with easy, fast, convenient, trackable, personalized, and predictive. Yes. And looking at a, both individually for each moment of truth, but more interestingly across each experience. And for instance, in this experience, the sort of top score it's getting is that it's very trackable, which is a great thing, but the lowest it's getting is in terms of it's not very fast. I get it. Yeah. And we already know from the discussion with that, if you've got lots of rules in there and you're having to have checkers checking checkers, even if this is a future state, mm. that's a scope to continue improving. Going back to the Danfoss example, where they got to six moments of truth, the first moment of truth was, oh, I need a part. Now I've got to go to the portal to order the part. And they had these big sort of Microsoft screens where you could touch the different parts of the screen. Oh, I want this part and you're just dragging it to order, yeah, yeah. which was quite smart technology and so on. Now they got that when they were all, when they were very centralized, but now we're moving to a much more fluid dynamic customer experience. And somebody said, just give it as, as, a, as an app. Mm -hmm. That's going to be logically the best thing to do. So those two moments of truth became one, you know, within three months of the go live, the moments of truth five and six, which were uh, moments of truth four was customer draws down part, moments of truth five, customer receives invoice, and moments of truth six, customer pays invoice. Yeah. And the logic of moments true four, where the customer draws down the part, because we're distribu distributing all our parts out to all our customers now, and they're storing them on behalf of other customers. The turnaround time's much faster, but also we're already integrated across 70% of our partner network in terms of shared data to the yeah. combined ERP systems and stuff. And we would know when they draw the part down, you know, because it lives in you know, with those people. And if we're in the business of confidence, Instead of sending them an invoice and that goes into the invoice cycle and then eventually we have to remind them they haven't paid us and then it come, the payment comes in and we have to process it. Could we not just draw down the cash from the bank account? Yeah, but the account, yeah. There we go. Yeah. I remember that and I remember that as being excellent. Yeah, I'm yeah. a great idea. Yeah. And it got that because five of the trust. Because yes, of the trust. Because of the trust. five and six. Now, there were some people who didn't have integrated ELP okay. uh, and it was worth Dan Danfoss have been progressively with those people installing that integration for them at no cost. Yeah, absolutely. It would have made absolute sense because you don't need a whole, let's call it debtors book management system. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And also the, if you've got say standard SAP and your payment uh, procurement cycle is like 90 days. Yeah. Your cash, you, uh, there's the finance people that organizations used to have don't understand the speed of cash in, they understand it from a keeping it point of view. <laughs> but they don't understand that it doesn't build trust into relationships and people will be less inclined to do business with you if they could get paid straight away. There we go. <laughs> uh -oh. So we've rattled through dashboard in there. The final one on the da dashboard is, of course, the disruption factor. Cool. And just to reiterate what I said earlier on, right, and I keep saying is finding the correlation between the change in the disruption factor and the triple crown. Yes. So that's why I created a triple crown on the diagram. Critical. That's the message the CFO needs to know. <laughs> yeah. And um, because that's the, in the boardroom, the one question asked, so what's our disruption factor reduction? We so saw it's 35% immediately yeah. and start thinking, oh, that equals approximately 20% cost reduction against one of the most expensive things we do. And it's not funny numbers, just as we demonstrated. Now people are more openly reporting them and they're in the double digit percentage shifts on Triple Crown. When Triple Crown was first talked about 12, 13, 15 years ago, it was like, why don't we just use the real numbers? 
and you go because the real numbers are very subjective and they're retrospective whereas we want to be able to estimate especially if you're going to be building budgets for next year so how can we improve these things now do we make them more dynamic cool so that's the last one was the disruption factor on the measurement system and you remind all the needless complexity if it looks a mess it's because it is a mess and all those all those post-it notes are points of failure there are places where things can and do go wrong so the longer it takes you to do something i remember what michael hammers one of the things he was saying about how long it should take for an invoice processing time and this one organization he was, I think it was forward he was talking to and it was like six months and you said well, that's like having your appendix out but being on the operating table for a week there's an optimum time to get this stuff done so why is it taking you so long and it was something similar to this where they'd have checkers checking checkers and so on no okay because the risk the failure is expensive because if the cycle time is so long you'd have to do it all again mm -hmm. and you go well, that's assuming that this experience has to exist in this way when she once you've had a look at it and improved it and we could go and do six sigma or lean on that but we wouldn't get it down from 20 days to 18 hours which is what these guys managed to do four moments of truth and the point of failure factor improvement associated with that one was 96 percent wow in its side okay so even if we're halfway wrong we're still in really comfortable territory absolutely So the other, the triple crown plus factors, the plus ones remembering in this instance, and these are all metrics, as you'll know, coming from that sort of the financial background is these metrics are all indicators. And whilst they might be output indicators, they're nevertheless they're like getting higher referrals, for instance, and how much money is actually spent on trying to get referrals. We have lower marketing costs because people will automatically renew. If you're experiencing, you, you damage the car and they return it to you the following day uh, and that's on average 18 hours sometimes if the car's written off as i think as someone have done this one before is you'll keep the courtesy car but they have a, a rule in place now which is the courtesy car that they supply for you is a better car than the one that you're driving such a small thing makes a big difference then the connecting of the dots across experiences like that is uh, so progressive what they do is they'll arrive in a car which is a better spec than the one that you've got right on the basis they want to do right by you and they want you to renew your premium when yes. it comes to renewal. The fact that they, it only takes 18 hours, one of the biggest feedbacks they were getting at that mo final moment of truth was, could I keep this a bit longer? <laughs> It'd be really good, cool if I could keep it for a few days and use it for the weekend and that sort of thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it, it's the velocity of the claim cycle, they call it now, how quickly they can run that experience from beginning to end. And in reduces the risk of things going wrong a big win for them was the reduction in fraud because if you've got so many interactions with customers and yeah. people are doing the brake checking that thing in which is like prevalent in america where somebody's in front of you and they slam the brakes and you run into the back of them because you don't leave enough distance yeah that amount of fraud in and around that in terms of automotive insurance the us accounts for something like 20 percent of all claims are wow. due to brake checkers yeah. and you know that's a real number it's gone away if you do it this way because, of course, the people who are doing the brake check, what Progressive do is when you get a new insurance policy, they offer you a camera front and back free of charge. Okay. Also inside the engine compartment, there's the black box, which talks about the way the car's been driven. And when it comes to an instant stop, it's that thing that pings back to base. And oftentimes, the Progressive will be first responders. So if you're not answering your phone, you might have banged your head or something. So they they're going to call the ambulance and police service quicker than the people who are on the scene who have probably been involved in the accident. Yeah, stunning. So it's a win. And a little bit like the pharmaceutical example that I've talked about, when Gilead did the transformation from 10 years down to effectively nine months in their instance, even when you go to other pharmaceutical companies, we don't do it like that around here. And you go to the in the financial services industry, the, there's, we're going to be in work for the next 200 years fixing you know, across the affiliate network because there's still people who say, ah, yeah, but that's progressive. So they're a different type of animal than us. And you go, well, all they're doing is processing claims. It doesn't matter what the claim is against. Exactly. Go figure, take that model and apply it. Oh, no, we couldn't do it like that. I actually will never sign it off. The underlines. And they're thinking about job, job security and things like that so, rather than the benefits to the customer. Yeah. So I think that is it on dashboarding. Cool. Let me do it on the side.